Green laser pointers are banned in Canada. Have you seen this? So the, so the denomination of Canadian bills. <laughs> No, it's not allowed because almost so the way that they get a green laser is they take an infrared laser and frequency that much. And most of these need a huge amount of IR around them. And so it's like getting a thing. They're getting a bunch of IR reflections. Gentlemen, I found you a minute taker, not oh, your albums, yeah. but not a jabber spray. Hmm? Who's the minute taker? Milk your albums. Friend of ours, first time ITF. Yeah. Thought it would be good if he immediately becomes part of the machine. Yeah. I got half of your cooking. Yeah, cook one. Sorry, it's a lot. <laughs> Give me some of your money. What you spending? Good afternoon. Welcome to the Cider Ops meeting at IETF one oh five. We're in Montreal. It's not even cold. Okay. Is it? Okay. Well, that's true. It's cold inside, not outside. Okay. Uh, I'm Chris. That's Kayer. That's Job over there helping out. Yeoman's work. We have a uh, we have a note taker. We also have the uh, what call it note well note taker. We I think we need a jabber scribe still. Does somebody want to jabber? And I don't mean at the mic. Terry? Oh, I thought you nodded. No. I can jabber. Aha. Okay. Warren will jabber. All right. So before we go through the AOB, and I know somebody's going to stand up and get off my business, for those people that speak at the mic, please. Keep the mic in front of you, or we can't hear what you're saying. <laughs> Thank you very much. Good example. The uh, thingy has a pointy pointy on it. You can point like this. There's a thing in front of you, so you don't have to do this. Because also, this is rude. All right. Oh, uh, is there any other business that you would like to discuss that we can add to the agenda? Yeah, go, go. <laughs> May I add one item? Certainly, depending on the item. The item is about diversity. Diversity? Diversity. Oh, diversity. I'm sorry about my uh, my accent. <laughs> yeah. No, no, I thought you were making a DNS joke. <laughs> <laughs> boom, boom, tish. It's the only other half of the internet we care about. Yes, why don't we do that as soon as Mr. Bush is done with his time? Fantastic, thank you. Thank you very much. Okay, we have these four other presenters and Mr. Manderson. We'll be a little squeezed on time, I think, so everybody should keep it short. Draft status, as it says, 
the documentation, all these slides, by the way, are in the meeting material, so you can go down to that and go, go to town. Uh, a couple of things were moved from the ISG processing to editor's queue, that's the TAL and the router king draft. Um, and we added some ASPA stuff and the valid editing BGP speaker that we're still working on. All right. Uh, yeah, slides, awesome. Okay, so go back. Alexander. Oh, you should also feel free to either hold the mic or use the little thingy stand. Not my slides. Oh, this is my slides. Okay. Uh, my name is Alexander Azimov. I work for Yandex. And today I'm going to provide you a very short update on ASPA drafts. So just to quickly remind, uh, remind you what are ASPA. So ASPA is Autonomous System Provider Authorization. So, but ASP is much shorter. So it's a new APK object that can be used to detect leaks and hijacks, malicious and mistakes. It, is, uh, it works outside of BGP itself. So it doesn't change the, the protocol. And uh, um, of course it can be automized with BGP roles, but it is out of scope. So, wait, good. Here is the change log. Uh, first of all, good news, the drafts were adopted by this working group. And I hope that it will boost uh, the uh, process of working on this document. And it's, it seems that I was right so, uh, since uh, recent discussion in the main at least was quite fruitful. And uh, previously we were stated that uh, ASPA can be used to verify ICE paths that are received from customers and peers. So now we have extended uh, the way ASPA can be used. And so you can now also verify paths that are received from customers. We are not speaking here about forged ICE path. But we are speaking about mistake, uh, mistake root leaks, and it is quite useful feature since all other uh, uh, drafts that are targeting route leak detection are not capable to detect leaks on, on customer side. Uh, we've also uh, uh, made a universe rule for uh, uh, what we should do with anomalies. So it must be uh, uh, all anomalies, hijacks, root leaks must be rejected. I will. Uh, go in the, into details further uh, later, sorry. And so let's get some details. Good. So there is uh, some text there, uh, I, but I will go over with you then, so it will not look uh, such uh, complicated. So uh, if we're sp uh, speaking about the prefixes that are received from customer or by customer, from provider or, for example, from IX, it may have two subpaths: the down, uh, the upstream path, uh, when uh, prefix uh, is traveling from customer to provider and so on and so on, and downstream path, when prefix is traveling down from provider to customer and so on. The connection can be a single autonomous system number, it can be a peering link, it can be a, a, a transparent IX. But anyway, the first downstream link will uh, uh, will have invalid outcome according to ASPA uh, a verification procedure. So in this exact exam uh, example, uh, IS3 is leaking, uh, IS1 is taking transit from IS2, uh, IS3 taking transit from both IS2 and IS4, IS5 is taking transit from IS4. So I hope it's, it will be clear. Uh, so According to ASPA verification procedure, the outcome from pair verification of IS2 and IS3 is invalid. As soon as we are going through first uh, uh, downstream link, all uh, 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 downstream links, uh, links that are, uh, 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 we can find after that in the path will, uh, must be also provided to customers. Otherwise, it's a leak. So uh, to, to ver verify this uh, uh, path, we found that uh, IS2 and IS3 is invalid. And after that, we check IS4 
and IS-3. It's very important to check IS-4 and IS-3 instead of IS-3 and IS-4, uh, because otherwise we are getting in problems with uh, siblings. And so if we have uh, these two invalid, the result is that uh, the, um, uh, in the downstream subpath, uh, sub there is some uh, uh, sub, uh, uh, there is a sequence which uh, goes up. So it's a route map. So I, I understand it may sound a bit difficult, but uh, in reality, it's very easy to code. And I have already, already dropped a piece of code in the main at least. You can uh, take a look at it. So maybe in words, it's harder to understand than uh, in the piece of code. So the, the second thing uh, is universe policy for anomalies. Um, previously, we uh, tried to uh, treat differently hijacks and root leaks. We had good intent. We believed that in some cases, root leaks uh, uh, may pass, pass by because maybe it's a good thing, maybe it's the only path to the originator. But uh, since uh, we're, uh, we're talking not only about uh, mistakes, we're also uh, talking about forged activity, the malicious activity, uh, the receiver cannot distinguish uh, if it, was, it is receiving a prefix that was leaked by a mistake, or if it's a receiving a forged ice path, which is a hijack, but uh, ice path was, was modified to look like a leak. So with this in mind, we, uh, we cannot distinguish leaks and, ice, uh, and hijacks from the receiver side. And the only policy that can, uh, can be applicable here is drop all anomalies that can be detected with ASPA. So what do we plan next? Uh, we are planning to make some proof of concept in the lab. Uh, we haven't yet decided how to do it. We, uh, we are still in discussion at this moment point. Uh, we need to bump the version of RTR protocol. Uh, unfortunately, it's uh, not extendable to add PDUs without uh, increasing the version number. And it seems that if we don't find any great security flaws in the design, we nearly, nearly ready for working group last call. Any questions? I see Rudiger is uh, nearly going to ask a question. <laughs> Job Snyder's NT team. Um, why did you put the deprecate AS set configuration set uh, reference on this slide? Uh, it's a good question. It's uh, my question to you, to the working group. Uh, so the, 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 uh, because it's um, for a proper ice path verification, we, ca we, ca we, ca we cannot verify ice set segments because they are unordered. And if we want to get rid of uh, um, malicious activity that may happen in BGP, we need to get rid of ice sets. And that's why it's here. And that's why I'm, I would like to, know, to learn what's happening with this draft. And if there is anybody willing to push it forward to finally get rid of ice sets, because uh, from the security perspective, we are relying on this piece of the document. And I even know that the authors of these documents are here. <laughs> well, okay. You are much there. larger there than you go. wrote it. Go. So I, uh, I mean, that's been sitting around for a long time, that document. And um, mainly Sriram had been bumping the version number every now and then. Um, what we decided at some point was and Randy and I had started working on this and then I got sidetracked again. Um, but we'd started another document which deprecates AS sets and atomic aggregate from BGP v4. We hadn't, hadn't actually got as far as publishing a version of that, but that seemed like it would be a much better thing to actually do. It turns out doing that requires all sorts of updates to BGP, like lots of remove this text, add this text, remove this text, add this text. And then, yeah, I got a little sidetracked. I mean, if it's really a useful, we could look at it again and Randy might have more to say. Yeah, but, but uh, from a space perspective, if we will have something that will already uh, uh, that will state that 
I, uh, I said, uh, 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 ah, deprecated, we'll be able to say that if we see an I said, for example, apply the same policy as for the hijacks it leaks and just drop it. I believe the current version is basically like ready if somebody wanted to adopt it and do something with it. But honestly, I haven't touched it in like, you know, a year or something, two years. Okay. I see. I see. Yeah, I see Sri Ram in the line. Sri Ram Nist, co-author with. Uh, I just want to add that uh, there is a version of it which is already a BCP, and they want. Then I then we wanted to convert it to a standard track. <laughs> so hopefully the BCP is helpful somewhat in the meantime, but uh, um, we can work on it to see if we can push it through in standard track as well. Great. I will be glad to see if this piece of work will be finally adopted and end up with the RFC status. If nothing else happens, as far as I can tell, uh, the interesting construct only occurs at the very end of the path. Uh, uh, are you speaking about this thing? No, 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 no. The uh, IAS set. Um, and uh, the way it usually uh, is constructed uh, is not relevant here at all. And uh, if nothing else happens, uh, one would need to check that, yes, it only can happen at the end. And then you could essentially uh, just use the regular path for whatever is happening here. Um, assume, assume that the first regular AS that shows up in the path uh, and the set is hidden behind it uh, to be the origin and you are fine. Because all the, all the tricky stuff that is happening inside the AS set doesn't, uh, well, okay, does absolutely not fit into this model anyway. And it doesn't matter. Uh, yes, I do agree with you, uh, but, but, but at the moment the, the simplification uh, does not say anything about if we can, if I said in the middle of this ice path is valid or invalid. Yeah. So um, to work, uh, to fight forged ice path, we should avoid at least uh, I said in the middle. Middle, I do agree. Uh, okay, and I, as far as I have observed them, they never were somewhere in the middle. Um, and there is a good reason for that. Yeah? Oh, yes. Yeah. Well, okay. Huh? Yeah. Um, well, okay. Unfortunately, I don't have... I do, well, okay, yes. Let me, let me put it into a question. Um, uh, would it improve the understanding of the whole thing if we did uh, a part in the documents that essentially uh, reveals the concept of what is signed in the in the A, uh, in the ASPAs uh, uh, the complex ASN1 use uh, typically typically confuses people who don't need to work with it. Um, and uh, I think I think uh, uh, that uh, the conceptual data structure that is transmitted there and what the, what its supposed semantics are uh, could be exposed much better and I somewhat assume actually the structure will after the uh, will uh, the, the the encoding uh, might actually change to adapt closer to the concept that's uh, being uh, that's being used. Are you speaking about IS zero? No. Um, yeah. Well. Okay. What what is the concept that is being used? You are coding a sets of ASs. Uh, and you are doing some strange trick in case you want to code a, uh, uh, an empty set. Uh, a kind of uh, why why not why not actually explain this and then code like it? Um, 
Uh, I remember that we had uh, uh, these questions discussed, we discussed privately. So my idea when I was writing it, uh, 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 introducing ICE zero was I was taking a look at uh, raw uh, document and just uh, uh, taking its design to look similar. So oh. there is row zero and uh, we have ASP zero. I'm not saying that mm -hmm. it is uh, yeah. well, okay. the, the, the final solution, but anyway, it's uh, it's very simple and from um perspective of the coding tools it doesn't really matter in what year do you have sets or do you have the, separate records from the implementation side it's uh, it's, it's nearly uh, the same kind of kind You're not of, going to configure it uh, uh, by yourself well, okay. all all matters all met all small matters of coding agreed uh for uh making people understand what they are supposed to do and why things work well kind of coding complications uh can be an obstacle uh and yes i also i also have another uh, uh now unhidden agenda uh if we actually are coding sets of as's uh that means that during the time the standard is is being developed and uh, uh, code and implementation and deployment follows over a couple of months. Uh, actually, the concept could be used by people who uh, agree on how to code in other ways that are already available, the sets of ASs. To actually, to actually use the te uh, 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 the technique, uh, uh, kind of essentially immediately. Yeah, uh, but anyway, generating, for example, using uh, ice path filtering using wildcards, it will anyway end up um, uh, with some generator of your configuration. I'm pretty sure that you will not uh, use. Uh, uh. Uh, Clicky to conf configure ah. it, and so it uh, doesn't. It should not really matter if you are working with a set the, or, uh, or a set of tuples. The uh, the issue here is much less the coding, which may be slightly easier or harder. Or well, okay, it doesn't matter, and I completely agree that yes, completely hand coding stuff is out of the question. Uh, but making making the concept that is used transparent to users uh, actually actually is valuable because well okay of course with a little bit of coding the user interface can also present concepts that are kind of hidden in what's happening underneath but that does not that does not really help. Okay. Okay. Yeah, so, uh, kind of, kind of, kind of for details. Offline discussion quite obviously makes sense. So, so thank you, Rudiger, for your comments. Uh, a real quick question. Sorry about that, Tim. Um, if you take AS configs out, um, do you want to propose what should be done if an AS config is encountered? Uh, so is it simply ignore it and go to the next AS in the CAS sequence? Uh, if we're speaking about protection against malicious activity, a forged uh, ice set in the middle of the path just nivellates all kinds of protection because it will end up that you are able to create a forged ice path in certain situations. So at the moment, the draft suggests to treat uh, Pass with I set, like it treats uh, hijacks and leaks. All right, thank you. Um, yeah, question uh, for clarification because I want to check that my understanding is correct. Uh, Tim, uh, and all that labs. Um, so, um, in my understanding, the semantics here are similar to what you have in origin validation in the sense that you would um, argue to drop invalid. So, if there's anything verifiably invalid, but when things are unknown. Um, that's okay. Yes. Right. Okay. Because the, the text um, in the document 
uh, seem to say something about treating uh, unverifiable things with some suspicion, and I'm not sure that that's... Uh, there is difference between unverifiable and unknown. Right. Unverifiable is uh, uh, exactly uh, <laughs> introduced for ISS. Right, uh, okay. uh, unknown is for uh, ice path. Yes. Uh, that, uh, so yeah. the ice path even returns, I think, valid in case of. So there is uh, for pair verification, there is three outcomes valid, invalid, unknown. For uh, ice path verification uh, 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 procedure, it should be uh, valid, invalid, and unverifiable. So uh, the unknown will be valid. Right, okay. That clarifies. Thank you. Um, but so, I, thank you for coming. I will check that it is clearly stated. Um, maybe somewhat related, but we can also talk about that offline. Um, but um, there is an AS who makes a statement here, a signed statement. Uh, and I asked earlier, like, maybe we should think about how to, to make that object. Because um, what I'm looking for, uh, what I'm thinking of is uh, atomicity here. If as an, as an AS I make a statement, maybe I want one object signed by an AS that has everything in it to ensure that I see the complete uh, policy that's applicable here and not risk that there are issues with uh, a bunch of objects where some of them are being published and withdrawn. And so that may be something to think about. Um, because with ROAS, that's different because um, there, if you put multiple prefixes on a single ROA and one of the prefixes goes away, then the object becomes invalid. But if this is signed by only one AS, then you don't have that problem. So you may want to think about that. Uh, I'm not sure that I properly get your question. Let's discuss it uh, offline. Yes. Uh, what I'm implying is that maybe if one AS makes a statement or a bunch of statements, they can put them all in one object. Yeah, but it can uh, a single IS may create objects only for uh, either uh, originating uh, autonomous system number. So you are creating yeah, yeah. objects for your providers. Mm -hmm. You can make, create more objects, but anyway, you're creating objects only for your providers. So what I'm implying is that as the the, the AS who is signing, I could put put all those statements on a single object. So there's no risk that. Um, when I publish things, uh, you miss things because you know it's still being processed and it's partially published, mm -hmm. etc. So it's not a big deal, but you know maybe something to think about. Okay. Okay. Thank you, Jeff Houston. Look, I'm not sure that I actually need a single object. The underlying constraint is, if you sign one of your adjacencies, you need to sign all of your adjacencies. Okay. How can I be adjacent to an AS set? And what might it look like? And, and this is this sort of weird thing where you're kind of go, I need AS sets deprecated, but I actually don't even understand how, if I'm signing all my adjacencies, how I can sign myself as adjacent to an AS set within your construct. And maybe that just simply finesses out the entire issue of AS sets because I can't be adjacent to one unless a whole bunch of other work is done to define what I'm adjacent to. So if I sign all my adjacencies and you see a path with me adjacent to one of these AS sets, I think that's a dud, you know, straight away. Thanks. Uh, the, I'd like to state it once or one more time. The problem with I set in the in the path is that is that it is unordered. It's not it's not the the, the numbers in it. But it, it but doesn't, it's, it's, it, it, it it's doesn't a, matter. It just doesn't matter. I mean, you're inside an environment where whenever you get a path, until you reach some golden halcyon day that's never going to happen, that everyone signs stuff, you're going to have to do partials. Yes. And if you're doing partials, no one's going to be incorporating. If, I'm, if I do my signing, I'm never adjacent to a set. The problem just goes away. That's what I'm suggesting. Chris, you can have the time. I'm not sure that's that I fully get your idea. I will try to reach your... Uh, late. Thank you. Quick. Jared Mach, Akamai. I, I don't know how many AS adjacencies I have. It's actually an unknown, it's an unanswerable question for me. So I, I don't know, I wouldn't even have a way to sign something to say who I'm adjacent with. 
because I peer with things like route servers. So I have, I have very many unknown AS adjacencies f just for my backbone AS. But how many uh, upstream providers do you have? We are not speaking about signing all adjacencies. We are speaking about only it, signing your IP transit providers. Uh, it is still a little bit indeterminate. That I might be able to answer, but some of the people, the agreement, it looks like peering, but it may actually be more like transit. So sometimes so, the so business relationships are a little bit fuzzy. Uh, we are not sp trying to define complex business relationships. The only thing that ASP does is if you create a record, you are just permitting what is called provider to send your prefixes to upstreams or, or peers and so on. You are free, for example, not to permit one of your providers to send uh, prefixes. You can do it. It's uh, it's up to you. So um, the uh, the core idea is that uh, yes, you never know your, all your agencies because of transparency access. It's not possible. But to list your providers, I think uh, ninety nine percent of ISPs in the world will be capable to do it. Okay. There's a bunch of conversation that probably needs to go on the mailing list for this. I think it would be a lot help, more helpful. Daniel. Clicker. No, no gift. Okay. So um, I would like to present to you our draft again. I have been at uh, the last IETF meeting at Prague. Um, so this time I will give you an update and we would like to go for last call soon to finish this draft. So this is about how to use RPKI validation at route servers and how to forward the result to the peers. So the draft is around for already about three years, more than three years. And there have been some substantial changes inside like added modes of operation, how to do it at the route server and how to forward the result to the peers. So the last feedback from the ITF 104 is um, basically about which uh, community to use and how, which uh, mode of operation to run at default. The motivation for this draft was um, basically to have something like RFC 1897, which says how to forward RPKI validation results in interior BGP. So at IXPs, we already have some kind of similar situation. We run kind of a more trusted environment to the peers. And it's natural for IXPs to forward some information with, uh, with routes. For example, where the route has been learned from, how far, like what's the round trip time to that route, things like that. So we would like to do the same with um, RPKI to tag the result of RPKI onto the route. So that would be make sense to make routing decisions for monitoring, troubleshooting, maintenance, or just to record it to have educational or to do some research about it. So just to get a picture on how it works, some of you already know it. Um, we get a prefix from, for example, ASD that goes into the route server. The route server is doing all its usual checks also doing um, RRD checks, see if the prefix is valid for the AS, if it's in this AS set. And additionally, this time it will also do um, RPKI validation. Then it can have different modes. For example, it can drop the prefix right away, or it can just forward the prefixes and tag the state, the result of the state onto the route to the, to the neighbors. And then it should go to the neighbors, but the neighbors shouldn't redistribute this to others. It's just the idea to have this at the domain of the IXP. So technically, we now changed from an extended community to a large community because this has been feedback from the last ITF meeting and it's now a standard. So basically, it would be we would have the ROA validation um, status um, at the last field which would be like zero for if it's a valid prefix, one if it's not found, if it's unknown, or two if it's an invalid prefix. We would also have the function-specific function um, number 
to signal that this is the um, RPKI prefix validation community. And we would have the ASN of the of the IXP, for example, that is um, distributing this validation result. Um, inside the route server, that would have there would be different modes of operation available. The first mode would be to just tag the result that the route server processed onto the route and distribute it to the peers. Um, the second mode of operation would be to drop all invalid. Um, prefixes and just forward valid ones and unknowns. So this would be now the default mode of operation and is basically like what is done today um, at several IXPs. And the third mode would be to, to drop prefixes with invalid and unknown, but basically do the best path selection after that so that um, valid routes would remain like uh, on top of all others. Operational recommendations in the draft um, is that peers that receive the result should not redistribute it to other ASNs. Um, if a route server is receiving such a community from a, from a peer, it should strip it so that it will not redistribute other um, checks. Um, then what's also common is that if the valid origin validation fails at the route server, the community should be admitted. There should be no community. And then if there's multiple um, validation results for a peer, if it receives multiple validation results, the validation result with the highest value should be, should be taken. That would be two for invalid, for example. So it's the most secure way to do it. So comments from the last meeting have been that we shouldn't, or there should be a mechanism to a signal if the um, validation couldn't be performed the route server. And we have this now in the operational recommendations to omit the community tag at the route server. Then one comment was that the draft has been overtaken by rea reality, which means that now more and more IXPs already drop invalids. But um, I, I see it like this, that things of the draft are now already implemented, kind of this. And we also define the communities to tag on. And also, if you go, for example, to the looking glass, you can see at some IXPs that they're already using communities. You can't just see, you don't see it on your router, but you see that internally, the route server is already using these communities. Then we had a discussion about extended and large communities. We now decided in favor for large communities. There was always the concern of outsourcing security. That means that you are giving like the security decision to the route server, but this is some, some trade-off that our peers doing anyway at IXPs, and there's kind of a trusted relationship. And then also discussion was always to drop uh, invalids by default, which we now adopted in the draft. Yeah. So with this, I'm open to more comments. And as I said, we would like to finish this draft uh, fairly soon. Doug Montgomery, but back one slide, what's the scenario where you get two validation results? It was like the last bullet of the previous slide. Yeah, the last point here. Well, when, when, what's the scenario and when, when this happens? Um, if your router is maybe peering with different route servers and there's two giving you different, different results of the validation for a prefix. So let me try. There's two route servers at DKIX. I appear with both of them. They happen to be unsynced with their perspective of the RPKI data. One says valid, one says unknown. What should I do? Uh, yeah, that would be like a failure scenario. Yeah, yeah true. Well, OK, but these Theoric. would be two different routes. And actually figuring out that you have two routes with different uh, communities, uh, I'm not aware of any of the currently available configuration language to have appropriate policy language. I think we've talked about this before, but not in this context. You have no guarantee that the highest value, if highest is valid. I think that was why you're, you, you have no guarantee that it's right. the more recent data, right? Okay, time, time wise, I don't know, but um, basically, if it would be at the same time, um, you should favor the higher uh, value. Uh, I wasn't suggesting a race condition. I'm, I'm saying the idea that you choose the one with the more favorable 
validation result isn't a sign that you're choosing the one that has the more up-to-date RPKI information, right? It, things could be effectively degrading. Yeah, it would be in favor of um, security, I think, in this case. The, 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 I think that's, I think, Doug, your point is that as the data in the RPKI is changing over time, I may choose to validate, I may choose to authorize you to do this route today and Job tomorrow and not you tomorrow. And if the data at the two different route servers is in a state where one has the old data, you, and the other one has the good, the new data, Job, I certainly don't want to accept the route with you in it anymore. Can I inject into this, honorable boys I've missed? We made an awful lot of tests last year about that. And you can have the following situation. Let's assume you have a router on the East Coast and you have a router on the West Coast. And they exchange their data and they have the same path. Both have two different validation caches. I don't know which of the validation cache has a more up-to-date data. It might be that the one that results in a valid is more up-to-date than the one that has the other result. It also might be that the one with the invalid has more up-to-date data than the one with the valid. So I cannot say just because I think out of security, because it might be a security that caused a certain prefix to be all of a sudden valid. So what now? Okay, I take this as a good comment for the draft. Thank you. Job Snyders, NTT. Um, in the case of failure in the origin validation process, for instance, how do you how do you define failure of the origin validation process? Because, for instance, if the cache is empty, policy will dictate that all of them become unknown, and then omitting the community is a fourth signal in this construct that contradicts with what we understand that unknowns are or not found. So we cannot differentiate, I think, between a, a failure in the origin validation process or the abstains of the validation process. Yeah, I see this problem as well. Um, and then a second comment. Um, if the default is to reject invalids, maybe you should remove the well-known uh, invalid uh, community. And then only two communities are left, the unknowns and valids. And at that point, I kind of wonder what the use case is because I, I think it's uh, not very valuable. Uh, and you should reconsider the words that uh, we can trust each other at an internet exchange. I fully agree from a commercial incentive if I were working for an internet exchange, but we in the transit world say transit is what you trust. <laughs> yeah, okay, so you shouldn't yeah, use hard service at all. John Scudder, um, now that you explained what the last bullet means, I, I would like to agree with Rudiger that um, one route has one validation state. It doesn't make sense to talk about having multiple validation states for a route. And as, as I understand, I, have, I would need to go and I, I haven't looked at this version of the draft, so I don't know what the normative language is, but it sounds to me like that should just be removed because it doesn't make sense to say that a route has two different validation states. It only has one, and it's the one that the route server told me. All right, thank you. Randy Bush, Jan Arcus. Um, I have problems with the trust model also, but that's been beaten to death. Um, why you switched which community confuses me. We already have a well-known one, um, and or pardon me, not well-known one, but a well-defined one. Um, but basically, as you'll see, the real problem in the that's expressed in the origin validation signaling draft, which you'll get to hear about boringly later, is that sending the community um, gets to my router but then what do I do if it's invalid? Okay, and the problem is that I want to cause withdrawal. And we haven't quite got the uh, route map semantics for that. 
yeah, uh, the community was changed because of the comments from the last meeting. So I understood that this is the right way to go and the default thing that is also done at route servers. So otherwise I understood that if we want to have extended communities, like it's done with the IBGP draft, you have to implement all the policies and we have to wait like 10 years. So yeah, we thought this is the way to go. All right, no more comments. All right. Thank you. Thank you very much. Tim, I believe it is your turn. Let me find your, aha. Whoopsie. The clicker thing, let me make this to go to the full screen. Yeah. All right. Um, yeah, Tim Berzels uh, and Elnat Labs. I'm going to talk about this draft, which is actually not our last call, as far as I know, but it is on the status pages. I think that's because HTTPS and tells was our last call. So it would be nice to rectify that, because this is not finished. Um, so goals still, this is similar to the slide deck I pre presented two meetings ago, where I said, shall we call it done? But um, still not done. Um, <laughs> and I'll get to, back to that in a bit, actually. But let's first look at the goals. Um, so we want to allow for key roles in the RPKI. There are many reasons why, um, but um, this might be useful. Um, I used to, to work for RightNCC where I was operating a trust anchor and we had a tender lock-in which regards to, to an HSM, so that's just one of the reasons why uh, this might be useful. Um, for relying parties, it's important to learn about these things. Currently, there's no way uh, except for somehow offline uh, n learning about a new trust anchor locator and including it. Maybe when you update uh, your your implementation, uh, you get a new tell with that update, but um, it's not very well defined. Um, so we also want to learn from experience in the DNS. Um, we like to, to have a, a way for this to be done that, you know, uh, lands well in, 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 into the existing standards. So it works well with what's out there. Um, Finally, uh, leave it trail for outdated clients. What I mean by that is that if you have uh, a piece of software that has a trust anchor locator in it, so that's basically the way your, your relying party tool binds the current certificate. Well, if that's outdated, it would be very nice if you can follow a trail to the current um, set of trust anchors that should be applicable. So a, there was a major comment on version two in uh, Singapore, which is, when is it safe? When do you know that you can actually drop an old key? So changes in three are, well, I hope that the text is more clear. Um, I could ask you for a show of hands who actually try to read it. But no, yeah, okay, great. Well, <laughs> um, I'll go through the phases um, here on the slide deck as well, actually. Um, but I try to make the, the, the document a bit more clear with regards to what's going on. I mean, we're starting from a situation where none of this is applicable. Um, how do you start to use this and how do you then do it, use it to make a, a role in a planned direction? How do you use it to make a role in an unplanned planned direction, let's say? Um, and um, as mentioned back in Singapore as well, uh, the draft now uses distinct URIs for where you can retrieve the TA certificates. Um, in an attempt to help figure out how many people are actually learning about this stuff and how many people uh, support the standard, if it becomes one. Um, now, the objects, this is ASM1. This may be a bit painful for people, but essentially it says that there has to be one or more current keys. The current key is defined as a sequence of or a sequence uh, of a certificate URIs, so it's a bunch of URIs and subject public key info. And in, in effect, that's exactly the same information as you find on a tell file, but in ASM1 uh, DR format rather than uh, clear text. 
Um, you can also have zero or more revoked keys. So, <clears throat> current situation, you have none of this, right? You have the trust anchor locator file, clear text file. It contains a bunch of URIs and the, the subject pop key info of a uh, trust anchor certificate. So relying party uses that to fetch a certificate, verifies it, and it goes off. A way to introduce this in a phase one, let's say, is add a, uh, what, a what we call a tag file to confuse tall and tag um, less, I suppose, um, where a signed object has a um, reference a URI to a location where the trust anchor certificate is signed and the same subject public key info. Now, when a relying party tool runs, they will encounter this and the text in the document currently says, well, when you learn about these signed statements, you should use the information in there to replace what you had obtained earlier from the clear text file you were using. Now, if you use different URIs for both, then as an operator, you can learn uh, where people fetch things. So you can also understand somehow um, how many people would be able to, you know, follow a trail, let's say. So that's the more significant change, I think, in this version of the document. If you go on though, for completeness, you can then add a new key, um, have new um, uh, tag files, as they're called, uh, referencing both keys. You could have tell files for both entry points, let's say, but probably if you intend to roll to uh, key two here, um, you might want to reach out to relying party uh, uh, software to include that in the distribution. Or you could actually technically even have a discussion about you know, using the, the signed format in, uh, in that respect. Um, then going further, um, you can roll to a third key and revoke the first. Um, an awful lot of drawings in here, and I'm not sure that I, yeah, we can have a discussion about this if people want, but I did present this before. Um, the main takeaway here is that um, I can revoke that first key on the tech file of the second. I don't need to do that on the third because people who learn about the third key will have already learned about the revocation of the first by looking at the second. The reason that that complication is there is because I'd like to avoid having to have a long trail of what are all the previous revoked keys. We could still include that, but you know it might make the object bigger than is strictly necessary. Um, so, um, the document actually distinguishes two ways here. You could say, okay, we want to revoke key one, so TA here, or you could say, well, actually, the one that we just introduced is no longer good. And it, it would technically look the same from a, a blind party point of view. Both current keys are just treated equally as current, essentially. And either key can revoke all the others. Now, the document actually allows for any number of keys and this is another question I think I have for the group as well. Um, while that leaves the, the um, makes the document flexible, I think it also makes it more complicated and strictly necessary. If we could constrain this to uh, scenarios where you only have ever have two keys, that might make, make things a lot simpler. So that may be well worth it. Um, now, then, what's next? Well, um, well, almost that. <laughs> I thought I included something, but no, it's in my mind. Um, I actually want to do real proof of concept uh, work on this, and I had planned to do that earlier, but I didn't get around to it. I'm still busy with uh, some other things, but I really hope to get there because I don't feel confident, uh, you know, going asking for last call on this unless I have running code that proves that okay, we can do a role. We can do a role where we went on with our intent. We do a role where we figured, no, this new key is no longer good, and I want to verify that you know following the trail actually works. So even though it takes longer, I would rather you know do it well than rush it. Um, 
and I'm not entirely sure that I can promise when I'll get to it. But, you know, see this update, that's where I want to go. Um, so question to the chairs, I suppose, would be please uh, get rid of the status last call because I don't think it's there. And to anybody else, I mean, if you have comments, ideas, concerns, like, you know, our little friend here, please speak up. It can be here, it can be in the hallways, on the mailing list, wherever. Or if you want to help test, that's also great, of course. So with that, the floor is yours. Hey, uh, Eric Osterwald, George Mason University. Um, so I think this is really good. I, I really like um, the approach you've taken and also the fact that you're highlighting a problem that um, I think exists in DNSSEC, among other places, where understanding what a key role is is proving to be very difficult because it wasn't very clear when the protocol was designed that key role is a really big thing. It's more than just sticking a key out there and using it and then sticking a new key out there and using it. You know, they actually wind up having a relationship to each other after they've been cycled out and whether they're still valid, they become replay vulnerabilities. I think there's a lot of like thinking through, are you rolling forward, are you rolling backward, and how do you actually represent that? That I think you, I, I like the fact that you're gonna do a lot of analysis. I think you might also sort of think through what are the various states that the resource is gonna be in as keys change and whether keys exist and you rolled forward, backward, and coming with a taxonomy for that, I'd be happy to work with you on that if you want. Randy Bush, IJ and Arcus. Um, like, um, like well enough that would like to see early security area reviews and suggest the uh, chairs go find some friends over there. Yes. Rob Ostein, Arcus. Uh, to your question about whether or not you can simplify it with getting rid of some of those infinite length sequences. Given you're talking about prototyping at first, which I think is a highly advisable thing, leave it as open-ended sequences for now. And if it turns out you don't actually need all those slots, then yeah, trim them because we've been seeing all kinds of entertaining things lately with people uh, pushing things that were not envisioned as more than three entries up to 10,000 and see what happens. Mm -hmm. Uh, Maarten Aertse, NCSC, uh, the Dutch one. Um, let's see. Uh, so you just talked about keys being able to revoke other keys, and that that's in the security and conservations uh, says that uh, currently any key can revoke any other key. Mm -hmm. So I was uh, thinking about this too, and I'm wondering if if you want to roll a key because you are not sure that it's safe anymore, for example. That that's the property you're looking for, and I don't know what the property is that you're looking for, but um, yeah, this basically made me question how that that works. So in the I, I know that in the TLS working group that they, they tried to get some of the academic uh, formal proof groups look at some parts of the protocol. I'm wondering if that's useful to be trying to do here with the the PKI bit to try and understand if the properties you're looking for are provided by the functionality you're modeling. And I'm not sure if, if anyone's willing and able to do that, but um, I guess it's this is, is a time where you can easily fix oversights. Uh, so uh, just questions, I suppose. Yeah, no, well, thank you for, for pointers because, um, you know, <laughs> Speaking for myself, I'm just making this up and hoping it, you know, works. <laughs> uh, so I can definitely use uh, <laughs> good advice. Sorry, I should keep it at a consistent distance, right? Um, so, um, but in terms of what we had in mind is, well, one of the thoughts is that if you have an HSM, you're usually well protected against key theft, let's say. Um, but uh, you may still want to do planned rules because you know, you want to change hardware, or, um, but you can still lose a key as well. Uh, in particular, like if you use card sets or people to protect key one, then, you know, you may not have a quorum anymore. Uh, and you may still have that quorum for key two, and you don't know for sure that it's going to go that direction. So those are some of the concerns here about, you know, why do this? Um, 
at the same time, if you, a lot of this relies on operational uh, procedures about how do you manage your keys, right? Because in theory, of course, if you have multiple keys and they can all uh, revoke each other, then you just need to have, you know, own one of these keys to wreak havoc. And clearly that, that can introduce, you know, uh, bigger security risks. So I think there's a trade-off here and, you know, I'm not sure that I have all the, all the answers, but I'm hoping that the use of HSMs will actually help in this regard and strong processes, but I don't think having this is enough. <laughs> you need you need to have all kinds of other, well, especially processes, I think. Yeah, your, your slide sparked my thought because you mentioned just now that you didn't want to revoke um, key one with key uh, with a package two and three. Uh, so that made me think about this. So if you don't want like the newest key to revoke, then maybe it doesn't have to be able to or, well, so you can think about that kind of property. And I'm, um, well, if you're referring to the one where I said only key two needs to revoke key one, that was mainly because you only need to learn about uh, key one's revocation once. And uh, so that was an attempt to stop, you know, the object from becoming really huge if you, you know, theoretically do, do dozens of these roles. Last two questions, then we'll move to the next. Okay. Sandy Murphy, Parsons. Um, I'm standing at the far mic because I'm asking a question from a position of ignorance and in case you want to throw things. Um, I have been impressed at the amount of effort it took to do the DNSSEC key roll. So this is a really good idea to get an early start on considering here. And so thank you very much for starting the work. I also remember the difficulty that there was in the CIDR working group to define the algorithm uh, change documents from very long ago. So what happens if your key role is also an algorithm role? <laughs> yeah. Um, um, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> okay, good answer. Rob Austin, Arcus again. Um, I haven't reread this recently, so I don't know if you've already covered it, Tim. My apologies. But one of the things that was a consideration at the liberty, taking the liberty of speaking from what I think Mike St. John's was intending with the RC 5011 for DNSSEC was the ability to pre publish keys before really using them. And that's basically because no one really knows how to do an emergency key role. An emergency key role for real, an unplanned one, is basically burn it to the ground and start over, which kind of sucks. So what you do instead is an accelerated schedule planned key roll, <laughs> which kind of requires you get the, the uh, for it to work well, you need to get the next key out there early. Um, part of the reason I'm bringing this up now is the question about whether or not there really should be some ordering in these keys so that you can't have you know the old one revoke the new one we probably want to put that into the bucket while we're thinking this through i think they're all good questions i'm just not sure what the answer is yet yep <clears throat> fair enough all right thank you very much next up is mr bush unless he ran away didn't run away haha -ha. You tell me, which one would you like to do, that one don't or that what, one? Don't care whatever comes up. Oh, uh, you know what? You got the old ones, right? <laughs> yep, with the wrong title on the right foil on the cheese. I want a refund. God damn. Pardon my French. All right. Origin we'll validation signaling matches the draft title. We yeah. are cruising. Okay. With the um, mic. We had a presentation. Well, look, I. Okay. Better? Yes. Okay. So, as uh, was kind of mentioned in a previous talk, there was RFC 8097 with an extended community for origin validation signaling. It kind of looked like this. And how does the receiver drop in valids? Yeah, I got the message. I gave you a prefix. You wrote back and you said it sucked. What do I do, cry? Okay, so I want to drop invalids as if 
I had detected it myself running origin validation. Okay, that should be the effect kind of. In fact, even slightly more strongly, I should withdraw all the announcements where I actually sent out the garbage, right? So think a route reflector with lazy clients. The clients don't run origin validation. But it would be nice if they understood this community and actually knew how to act on it. And this isn't policy. This is actual behavior change. I'm getting a scowl from John. <laughs> and that's why, because it sounds like work. <laughs> okay. Um, and it's not just the route reflector situation, but here in this draft, we specifically talk about trust boundary. Okay, it's only within a pop. It's not outsourcing it. Okay, do not share your needles with customers or friends. Okay, so here's where we kind of differ with the uh, route server issue. Okay, hello. Okay, as route of origin validation deploys, we really want to do something like this. It would be a bit of an accelerator, make it easy for some people, et cetera. Okay, and we'd like to request WG adoption. You also want an email to the list or will that do? Please email the list because I will forget in about now. Do you, you remember to go to the next presentation? Oh, you, because you just said so. Do you have questions before? Hi, John, John Scudder. Um, I want to explain why I was scowling, which which wasn't the reason you said, I don't think. Um, if I understood your summary slides correctly. You're scowling because of withdraw the ones I already announced. Right. That should be a natural consequence of a policy that says I'm not accepting this. I already route. accept. My, no, the problem is I'm a route reflector yeah. client. Yeah. Care gave me a route. Yeah. I accepted it. Yeah. I pass it to the route reflector. Right. The route reflector says and sends the signal back to me. Uh, to you. Yeah. Thank okay. you. To me. Okay. okay. And I've already accepted and re announced now, the now I understand what you're asking for. I don't think I like it, but I'll think about it for a while. <laughs> That's why, that is why I thought that's what you were scowling at. This is work and slightly ugly work because it's not only that announcement, but it's all the other announcements of the same prefix with the same origin. Right. <laughs> <laughs> yup. Job Snyder's NTT. So you're kind of sticking BGP withdrawals for off link peers into a BGP community? No. Because what the route reflector, so the route reflector decides this is invalid. It sends a signal back to the spoke that could be, I don't know, a well known community mm -hmm. or a new attribute. The no, spoke. It's the, the community that's already documented and defined. We're just then saying the, the semantics spoke weren't complete. What it received from the eBGP peer as a withdrawal. And then it will send withdrawals to no. the other route servers. No. No. Routes maybe, maybe care can say it better. Route reflector, when it receives routes from its clients, will run a best path and will announce a best path, a best path. When it does, the community tags on top of it to say what is wrong with it. Now, route reflector could say path one is the best, but path four that I just received had a bad community. So it could do add paths and piggyback path four and say this is wrong, take it back, which will be the net result will be same, but it could also send it on the path one, which was the best path. That is what Randy is trying to say, I think. The spoke receives the signal. Then what does it do? It should perform origin validation? No. That the point is when the spoke receives the signal, it withdraws, it drops the invalid, 
as if it had detected it, but it has no cash feeding it. So and it treats, withdraw any announcements it, it may have made with that invalid origin. In other words, this is signaling withdrawals over PGP communities. In a sense, it's signaling asking you to withdraw. Chaired March Akamai. And, and then it decides, oh, I might have seen this again because somebody did soft reconfigure route refresh, and now I'm going to send it back up and loop it, loop it and create a message loop. This, this sounds potentially very scary and messy. Actually, what Randy is trying to say, and I'm channeling him, so keep me honest. When it receives an extended, when a uh, edge router receives an extended community, for that given prefix on an edge router, for all the paths, it will go and loop and say, wherever you find AS path, which is incorrect, mark that path ineligible for best path. Rerun the best path and then announce that new best path back to the route reflector so that if someone does a route refresh in again, you always, always send out the right path. Does that make sense? Uh, Maybe I, I have 10 minutes for two presentations, gentlemen. Yep. Yeah, which, which, <laughs> may, have be, a mailing which list. may be none, and it may, yeah, I could see this getting very messy very quick. Uh, I had a second question. If we're going to modify the edges uh, to accommodate the behavior, why not just implement origin validation? And I don't mean to be cocky, but... No, no, no. That's perfectly valid. That's my personal instinct, of course. But there are others who've said otherwise. They want to have more centralized control at that level, just as they have single or, you know, paired validators in a pot. Rudiger, I'm sorry to be rude. I have another presentation. How am I doing for time? You have about five minutes. For the second presentation. Yeah, right on time. Can we move along, please? Sorry gentlemen that's the Is next that right? button pluck the magic twanger okay um update the content on the thingy the Go meeting materials it. are correct this just is wrong but uh, it's only the title i see right? what you're saying is that, yeah, yeah, I sent him the email on this that he asked for is this says signaling with this says egress. So that's just a very funny spelling of egress. <laughs> Ignore it. <clears throat> this is incited by Professor Volk. So the problem is the origin AS may be modified by outbound policy. And also note that the origin AS is null when it's preparing to be announced. Okay, so it will definitely be modified by outbound policy for if it's being originated here. Okay, so we want policy semantics based on validation. <laughs> should be applied separately to distribution into BGP, which we've, we've already defined and kind of have running, and separately to egress. Because I can munge the path, change the effect of origin. I could have a selection of ASs on this router, and I'm the originator. And I choose which one I'm going to tag, et cetera. So I want to be able to apply origin validation to what I'm about to announce. Because I don't want to hear from Warren's knock when I've got bad breath. OK? So. When applied to egress, the effective origin AS, then note that's the effective origin AS, must be used to determine the origin validation state. And 
Yes, I will send you an email to request adoption. Thank you very much. No extra charge. Mike? Go on. I will. Mr. Manderson. So I don't have a fun slide for you, so I'll just go back to the schedule slide. Thank you for your um, your time. So my name's Terry. I'm a root server operator. I'll be very clear that I only speak for myself um, as a root server operator and for the root server that I operate. I will not speak for any other root server operator. I want to draw your attention. I am talking about DNS. And there's a reason I'm talking about DNS. I'll get to it in a minute. Yes. Yes, root. <laughs> Not route. Um, so th there's a lot of a, a, a lot of push to, to do um, RPKI because you know you, you'll look better, you'll you'll grow your hair back, and, and you know you'll be more attractive to the opposite sex. All those sorts of things, and that's fantastic. There are two documents I'd like to draw your attention to just slightly. You may not understand uh, where they come from, but uh, you can Google them and, and find them. There's something called um, RSSAC. Uh, 021, RSSEC is the Root Server System Advisory Committee, and RSSEC 021 essentially says that the failure of one root server operator is not critical to the operation of the entire internet. And that's good. There's a second document, um, RSSEC 042, which says um, things about the independence of root server operators. And one of those things that it discusses is that root server operators will be diverse in their operations and their network operations and infrastructures. So, now I think about this, and this is my perspective only, no one else's. Uh, someone might share it, but this is my observation, is that if the root server operators all do RPKI, they are then impacted should one of the five TAs have an, a situation. More so right now, if one particular operator, TA operator, RPKI operator, has an issue, it will affect nine root server operators. Discuss. <laughs> Hi, Terry. This is Florian. Hi, Florian. To see you. I'm also a root server operator. And I learned about this about five minutes ago. So what I figured out with uh, Natalie and uh, Robert help from the NTC is, it turns out even if you're not doing RPK, if you don't have an Aurora, you still have a problem. Because someone can get Aurora. Ben Madison, welcome on. Um, I presume the, the, the single TA operator that you refer to as Arid, and that's because that's where most of the... It doesn't matter who it is. It's arbitrary. Well, I, whether, I, whether there's, there's 12 organizations that operate root servers, there's only five organizations that currently do that. In this current model, okay, I'm, I'm not trying to propose any solutions. That's not my job yep. here. I, my job is just to highlight that I see there that there is a diversity issue. Yeah. Um, no, I was asking to make sure I was understanding the problem, as you said. Um, this is presumably exacerbated by the fact that all five are claiming root in their root CAs at the moment. No, not necessarily. It would actually also exist if there was a single trust anchor. And it could be worse. Sure. But it's still. Um, so you don't see this being improved from a diversity perspective by having the the numbers from which the root servers come from more widely spread around amongst the so even they're distributed i don't see it as a as a it's better mm. but it's not ideal in, in my opinion again this is all my opinion my observations job snyder's nct i have trouble grasping the problem. There are five root certificates, and there are 13, uh, 26. 
prefixes and you can distribute the 26 under the five tiles. And that's not a, enough diversity. Can you uh, do the numbers for your first two RSAC documents, please? 0, 021. Sorry, no, not those numbers. The the internal numbers, like the first one was, it's okay if one root server has oh. disappeared. Yeah. And the second one is? The, the, the first one is, it, one, it's okay if there is one um, one root server operator fails. The second one is uh, a, um, a principle that's set for the operation of root server operators. Um, and that is that root server operators will have diversity in their operations, inclusive of network and, and stuff like that. So if you sign half of them, not sign the other half and distribute amongst the multiple RERs, you're done. I don't know. Is that the answer that that cider ops would recommend? Is that within our mandate? You oper this is where you operate RPKI and cider and stuff. This is where your expertise is. It's I not would, it's I not would, my expertise. In that case, I would recommend you uh, try to transfer at least one IPv6 prefix to another region as an experiment to see if you can obtain access to other certificates. Hello, oh, my name is Carlos. I work for Langnick, one of the fire errors. Uh, we would happily welcome you guys. I mean, we, can, we have <laughs> policies that allow us to assign prefixes for critical infrastructure that can be used outside of our region. And I believe the other four have similar policies. My, my comment is that I, I don't think that's a problem for us to solve. I mean, as CIDROPs, I think if you have nine prefixes within a single IRR, you guys are a bit weak on the diversity aspect that you apparently are defending on one of the documents. I don't know what the solution is. I mean, you could roll IPs in some of the root servers, distribute them among their IRRs. You could get new space from us. You could transfer, like you have said. There are a bunch of ways in you could actually create more diversity in that aspect of the root server operations. Maybe someone should like write a document that defines some things that you should do. <laughs> uh, you know, but, but is that, there's is no that advice. There, there, there's <laughs> no advice about this to date. You know, what? I have my my statement for applying to RSAC. <laughs> In my computer, I've had it for a while. I think I've, this is the right time to submit. Maybe it is. T Terry, can I ask another clarifying question for the Of next? course you can. Okay. I, it sounds to me like you're using the root servers as an example organization. And I'm not using the root servers as what? an example. Okay, sorry, you're using your root I, server. I have a problem. Okay. Okay, I have people telling me that I need to do RPKI. I am nervous as heck well, about maybe, doing it sorry. because I don't want to end up on the front of Time Magazine. Too late. Oh. So, <laughs> they don't make a magazine anymore. Uh, I think the, the <laughs> depth. I, I guess where I, where I was trying to go is you, there are some things that are sort of hot button topics and maybe the issue is not, not necessarily a root server problem. This is a general network operations problem. If I operate something, a large resource on the internet or something be. that's interesting to me from a business perspective, I have to have redundancy, diversity, you know, failover sort of capability. And my business continuity plan maybe didn't take into account that I have all of my resources in one RIR. I wasn't making that point, but if you want to adopt oh. that, that's fine. Okay. I was, yeah. I was making a point simply for, for my own operations. As, as selfish and lack of altruism as that is, that's where it was. Okay. Robert. Hi. Robert Kirsten, Kira Weib, NCC. I am not a Rupert root operator. I have friends who are. Um, three things. First, what Chris said, in, I don't think that root, the root servers are any special in this context. Just a, a statement. Yeah, that, that's fine. I don't like the idea fine. of golden numbers and stuff as well. So. That's fine. Um, second statement, we went through the scenarios um, over lunch. Um, and I'm happy to talk to you or anyone who is interested or we can form a, some kind of committee, whatever. Um, but the end result of the discussion was that 
no operator can be worse off than today if they ha also have ROAS and RPKI. They may be better off, but they will not be worse off in case of attacks and so on, okay? It's not just every day, but if shit hits the fan. I'm happy to talk about it, as I said. Um, the third statement is that <laughs> it's a bit tongue in cheek, but root operators already synchronize on protocols and everything they do. You all run IPv4, IPv6, BGP, blah, blah, blah. So you might want to, you know, if you want to diversify, then you might want to do IPX or something. Yeah, that's pretty much tongue in cheek. Doug Montgomery, just to be clear, so you're afraid of either accidental or malicious ROAs being created that cause other folk to drop your route, or? It, it, it could be anything. Um, I'm trying to understand the threat it, scenario, it, which doesn't cause. All right, I, look, I understand that. It could be an operational failure at the entity that is uh, signing. So. Which causes which might be the, your resources to become unknown? It would become invalid. If it becomes invalid, then the, the route would the, those be... Those people who are filtering invalid can't reach you on that address. Correct. Especially if that, that, that the people who are filtering are a transit, then all of their customers can't reach. Get a good slurm value. Randy Bush, IJ Narcus. Um, first, for everybody else, Suggestions that involve a root server changing its IP address are for after I'm dead. Um, the protocol, if you get farbled, I don't care. There are 12 other root servers. Um, so doing drastic structural action in the RPKI or the protocol is doesn't get a lot of sympathy. Uh, thirdly is I would refer you to about a three-year-old presentation that shows you how to escape Aaron. All my resources are ripe. <laughs> All my V4 and V6 are in ripe. Oh, not my V6 because it's not my. V6 I, I didn't mean this to be a beat up on on any RIR. That's not why I'm. Oh, you said you have a whole bunch of the root operators are in one RIR. That's a, that's a facet of history. Move whatever was the cause. What I'm saying is some of them could move without okay. changing IP addresses. I, I think my key point is that even if we all moved and, and shuffled around, it would be still be 12 organizations being compressed down into five organizations. So your diversity set is now five. It's better than one, A. And B, I refer, True, you, to, I may refer you to Robert, who said being having your ROA is no worse than having no ROA. And your response was incorrect when you said the holder of that ROA could farble and issue a bad AS, is the detail you're worried about. And they could issue a ROA with a bad AS for you if you hadn't registered. Rob Ostein, Arcus, uh, two observations. One, you're not going to settle this or get coherent advice today. This is a little bit too new. To people. I know. I, right. I thought I'd raise it um, anyway. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, other thing, though, I think you need to make a distinction between reliability and availability in the two services you're talking about here. Um, the fetching and caching behavior of DNS is very different from the fetching and caching behavior of the RPKI. You can probably survive an outage of no new stuff being published in the RPKI for a while. I mean, eventually you'll start to have problems. You know, CRLs get stale, blah, 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 blah. But if people aren't using stupidly short expiration times, you can last a few days, right? A few days of a root server being out would probably be more noticeable. So you may need to do the numbers on how long of an outage is acceptable, that sort of thing. And yeah, getting slightly that's, better. That's good observation. Yeah. Getting slightly better distribution, but you know, 12 divided by five, there's only so much you can do. Jeff. Jeff Houston. 
accidental player inside the ICANN circus from time to time. Look, RSAC exists for a very good reason. And part of that reason is to observe, understand, and possibly recommend. You've raised an interesting issue. And, and part of the issue is whether you should sign and what the associated sort of issues of diversity, where the addresses get sit, and so on. And I think they're great topics. And you should consider from the perspective of all 12 of you, what you should do to give yourselves both diversity and maximal availability and performance and so on. And that seems to me like something that RSAC should investigate and harness resources and do study for maybe invoking expert commentary or whatever RSAC wants to do. I think it's difficult for this group to understand the particular needs of those 12 operators or even just one in isolation. And your motivation about diversity is perhaps best studied in detail in RSAC. I'm saying in short, not here, not now. Guess where I'm going next. Well, great. And I'd all, but, but wait, I didn't want to go there and then all of a sudden, you guys get sideswiped by well, I, a I, random I, I, I question. So um, I, I'm being polite in this situation, right? And I think the politeness is more that RSAC might circle around either the group or one or two of the group and get some more data as they do their investigation. And that's great, and it's great that it's forewarning. As I said, it's a bit tough to say to us, solve it, because, like I said, wrong place, wrong time. I'm, I'm not asking you to solve it. I'm asking you to think about it. That's why I said discuss. I didn't say solve. <laughs> Because I actually don't think it is solvable in in the sense of a protocol sense. As Randy pointed out, it would be a significant architectural change. And I don't think that is rightly appropriate, but other things can be done. Like many things about the root service system, it's about assurance to the community that the you know we're doing as well as we can do. State of the art is there. And you know, I think RSAC is perfectly capable of getting to that kind of advice without necessarily committing myself one iota to doing any work at all. Just just a note on time. We are over time, so there are whatever cookies are the next thing coming. I... Uh, Vasily Dolmatov, just one general remark. It's a common thing that if, when you are implement some mechanism to cope with some att attacks, then you will have additional failures uh, connected with a possible failure of that mechanism. It's obvious you should leave the, that. The problem is that the gains from implementing that me mechanism overweights the possible drawbacks from this mechanism being broken. So you just brought the common general question. So is it worth to implement the mechanism, just the drawbacks will all wait uh, gains. So, so a everyone should decide by himself, so. Doug. Doug again. So it seems like your risk is the same no matter what decision you take, right? Because it's the other people doing validation. If if a CA is compromised and somebody creates a, a you know, a, a wrong ROA for your resources, whether you take action or not. I'm host, correct. Right. Okay. So it seems like you can make your decision as to whether you whether you fear route hijacks to the roots, routes, route hijacks to the roots, <laughs> more than you do, you know, compromise massive failure to RPKI in the way that would generate invalid somewhere else. I, I, I think of I've done enough here, I've, I've raised the awareness of it, and then I think the rest can be discussions over beer perhaps, because I think we're kind of out of time and cookies are waiting, so. Uh, what is, what you would propose a mechanism for follow-up on this? Is there a working group that works on this, or an institution? Um, like, if we have a great idea, where do we send it? I, <laughs> um, my next steps, and what I'd already planned, is to raise it at, uh, at RSAC. Um, a bit of information is that I am also a representative at RSAC, um, and I'm also a member of the RSAC caucus. The RSAC caucus is the thing that does the work for RSAC. So 
it will be raised in RSAC. That may also spin off into other requests into other parts of the, the ICANN ecosystem, including something called SSAC, which I do know Jeff is also a, a member of, and some others here in this room perhaps as well. So yes, there, there's additional stuff coming through. And I, I think Jeff's right. I think those groups will circle back here, but I think it was good to just raise it. And so you have some awareness of, of issues, some operational issues that are caused by this particular corner case. And as, as Chris pointed out, possibly by other organizations who might think the same way. Thank you so much. I really appreciate it. Thank you. Thanks, Terry.